Vince Guzzo, president of Cinema Guzzo, and yeah, Dragon go. on uh, CBC, Dragon's Den. It's Kellen, and today on Diversified Game, a real treat from Canada. This is for the Canadian audience. I have Mr. Sunshine himself from the Dragon's Den, Vince Busso. He's going to give us the game, and I'm just so happy that you're here because from we get Shark Tank here. I'm a nerd, so I get to watch a little bit of Dragon's Den in Canada and even the one in Kenya. So welcome to the show. Thank um, you. Know, yeah, let's get into it, because I just love some of your predictions, but I right. really want, I, especially the ones on how Netflix is going to change and how you see Paramount, you know, possibly getting Netflix. I mean, you're, right. a vision, you're a visionary. Let the people know what you have going on right now in this season that we're in. So, I mean, this season was a great season. I mean, I did a few deals. I can't mention any of them because they haven't aired yet, but we, we you know, I think I closed about 10 deals out of those 10 uh, we went into due deal on all 10 of them, and I think we've closed four of them already. Um, and so, you know, it goes, it varies from food space deals, from gyms, uh, medical clinics. So, you know, we're a bit all over the place this year. Awesome. Now, you, you know, are Mr. Movie. And I, I really want you to, like, let people know why the movie business, even in COVID, you know, why you see that. It's not dead because a lot of people say movies are dead. Netflix Prime and all these other things have taken over. Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is the movie going experience isn't dead. I mean, we've been announced, you know, the, the death of movie theaters has been done every 10 years, roughly. And, and nobody really understands that I'm not that interested to bring my uh, to go on my first date on the couch at my mother's house. Or, or you know, I mean, I think everybody needs to realize that going to the movies is not like watching a movie. There's a difference in being in an auditorium with 150 people, getting scared all at the same time while watching Halloween or Friday the 13th and crying all at the same time when Leonardo DiCaprio dies at the end of the love story movie, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, going to the movies is about an experience. And, and, and if people really think that being at home in your couch with your joggers on is an experience well then then maybe you should get some real like you know action in your life and, and make your life way more exciting than it is right now this this is why you could have your own talk show because you know to really let it go i saw you kind of pause you could have given it to them and this audience can take it because they need to get it hard but right. like, having a first date in your house maybe that's something you guys in college want to do because we know you got one thing on your mind but for right. those romantics who actually are looking for a good wife and to have five children like you do, you're looking for a real, you know, romantic experience. Where does that come from? Is that the Canadian side or the Italian side? Well, no, I think ultimately, you know, look, the being outspoken, I, I think we have a, I think we have a, 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 I guess, an image of what, you know, Canadians are, right? And we all believe Canadians are tame and, and so forth and so forth. The same way. Americans, uh, you know, have an image, which is everybody believes America is New York, Miami, Chicago, L.A. They don't realize that there's tons of other people that live in between all of those cities that make America what it is. So, you know, for sure, the, the Italian immigrant side, you know, in, in me, you know, it makes me a little more outspoken, makes me a little more go getter. I always like to say the biggest problem I have is I have a short memory. So I can't lie to people. So I got to be honest. Sometimes it's brutally honest. Uh, and, and so, you know, I make people cry on the show. No need to cry. I mean, it's just take the truth for what it is, right? But I mean, I think we live in a world where things need to change. I, I think we all need to talk a little more, text a lot less, and communicate, you know, uh, 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 while looking at each other and, and actually getting the full-fledged meaning of what you're saying versus just, 
trying to interpret a text. Uh, man, we need to have like a whole soundtrack on that because the world is going crazy and way too sensitive, at least for, for me. Maybe my kids say, maybe because you're getting old, Dad. Uh, is that what know? it is? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just getting started and getting good. Now, being a citizen of both countries, um, and it's something that I'm actually in the process of right now, and we talk about it here um, do you find a benefit of being able to go back and forth? Because besides the crypto guys who say, hey, this country is going to be a lot nicer to me than this one. What benefit do you find having, you know, both? Well, you know, look, honestly, I think that the more access you have to varied culture, the more, you know, so when I became a dual citizen between Italy and Canada, I did it first and foremost for my kids to be able to go study in Europe without necessarily having any uh, uh, work permit or study permit issues, right? Because they automatically became dual citizens. It also allows me to choose where I feel I want to live and, and, and the kind of life I want to live, right? So as long as I want to be in the rat race, I can live in one place. The minute I want to slow down a bit and I can go back to the homeland and, and relax and chill, you know, near the, near the beach, near the ocean and, and, and so forth. So, I, but ultimately, what it really does is it reconnects you with the various countries, right? I mean, I've always said in school, what we should do is drop the single religion classes and make it a multi-religious class. So that maybe if we all understood our religions a little better and we understood what everybody has in common, maybe we'd appreciate everybody a lot more, right? And, and that's the ultimate secret with cultures. When you get to learn the French culture like I did in Quebec, when you get to learn the English culture in Canada, like I did, when I got to go to the U.S. and I understand what Americans think, and when I go to Italy and I see what they think, it gives me a varied, more multitude experience where I can communicate with people a lot better and feel better being where I am, wherever it is that I am. Well, and, and that's why I think, you know, one of the reasons Canadians are have a, a better rep around the world, you know, friendly, um, more educated. You guys know history and geography and the rest of the world does. But when you come to America, you know, point on a map, Malta is the same thing as Italy, as the same thing as, you know, the UK. Um, it's almost I mean, we look at Canadians just at a whole different level, like we glorify Canada. But I, I know Canada, I've been to Montreal and Vancouver, it has its own issues. When you come to America, I just want to know your honest opinion when you talk to the majority of people who aren't in the New York, aren't in the San Francisco, like, do you see us as like, these guys got to pick up a book, or they got to travel more, more of them need a, a passport. I just, you know, this is a teachable moment for the American audience of how the world sees us. I got to tell you, I admire the U.S., uh, I love going to New York, but I also love, you know, Chicago. I love L.A. I love Vegas. I, I and, and I love the people. I mean, I, I vacation in the Hamptons very often and I don't only communicate with the New York billionaires. I actually communicate with the locals, with the farmers. And I actually think Americans are genuine people. I think the problem is that many times the message gets lost in translation. Right. I mean, and, and, and we live in a society where you're not supposed to say it's OK to want to make money. Right. But but if somebody only understood that I don't want to make money for the sake of having money, I want to make money so that I can have the freedom to do what I want with my days and, and, and to buy what I want to buy and to vacation as I want a vacation. Right. So so I, I think there's a connection missing. And I think American are seen as a little too imperialistic. But at the end of the day, I, you know, I got to tell you in in Italy, where I, the area where I come from or where my parents come from, it's actually a, a huge amount of uh, uh, admiration for Americans. In fact, Levi's jeans are worth more than Armani jeans in Italy because of the American factor. Right. And, and it's always what, what's always sad to me is when I look in, I, and, and this happens in, for Canadians as well. Right. There's no bigger critic than our own people to ourselves. So the fact that Americans will beat up on each other saying, you know, we're, we're we know we've got a bad rap in the world. That's because that's all those people choose to bring back to the U S and want to, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of share the truth of the matter is I've gone to places and I tell them I'm from Canada and they say, Oh, so you're American. It's no, no, I'm from Canada. Yeah, that's right. You're American. No, I'm Canadian. Yeah. But Canada, U S same thing. 
right? So it's awkward that, that you would say that, you know, we're, we're a different country because in the perception of people, we're not. It's one big North American territory. And especially in Europe, with, once they united, they felt that Mexico, uh, uh, U.S., Canada, one big lump country. And I got to tell you, I feel that sometimes what divides us is the interest of politicians creating the division so that they can sneak in in the middle and, and win with, you know, with a, with a sh- smaller percentage of the vote instead of really getting to convince everybody. Yeah, you, met, you, you, you totally almost took out my politician question, because when you talk like that, would you ever consider running in Canada or in Italy for office? So I'll tell you, um, I've considered it. Uh, given the impact COVID has had on the overall business, I think I'm going to stick to correcting and making sure everything's back in line before I relook at a, at a, at a run at politics. Uh, I can guarantee you that if I did politics, it would be a different kind of politics, meaning my, you know, the first principle that I always bring into politics or I tell politicians is the general public is intelligent enough to understand if, if you believe they don't understand, it's because you're a bad communicator and you can't communicate the message to them. So, you know, the fact that during COVID, we were not given the facts or not explained in detail everything that was going to get done and how we were going to handle this crisis, for me, is more symbolic of the lack of communication skills of the people that regretfully we put into power, because that's the other big problem is we're, we, we really put the wrong people into power. We put people into power based on charisma, based on hairdos, looking good or whatever, instead of saying, how could you handle a crisis? Could you face the the anxiety or the stress levels that are required to put a country, you know, and get it through from point A to point B through a crisis, right? And, And in fact, you see it. If we take an example of the U.S. government, every president in the U.S., that has had a a military career, has always managed internationally to not go to war. Every president that never went to war, never had a military career, has always managed to get us into a war. And the question is that you really have to be somebody who's seen the horrors of wars to know to what extent you have to go to avoid it, right? And, and, And I think it's very important that we need to understand that when somebody's 21 years old and he runs for politics, it's great. It's, it's, it's motivating. It's, it's sort of uh, refreshing. But it's also somebody who's got 21 years of experience, which isn't the same thing as somebody who shows up at 50 years old into politics and says, you know what, I've accomplished and I've made mistakes. And those mistakes are what are going to allow me to make sure we don't repeat these mistakes as a nation, as a country. Right. And I think we, I, so, Without saying we can do better, I think the whole world can do better when it comes to political uh, 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 um, players and and political candidates that we're going to be voting for in the next few years. Well, you know, if you do go for that, depending on wherever you go, you'll be going for sainthood if you do that, because it would definitely be a pay cut unless you want to do like most politicians and, you know, pad the pockets, which it, it is what it is. But you are already knighted. And I want to just know, for somebody who's been knighted, like, how does that feel to get that? Because, that, I mean, not even a, you know, a quarter of the population will ever know what it is to be knighted. And what perks does that give you just in life? Well, you know, what's interesting is that most of my life has been in Canada, right? I mean, I've lived in Canada. I've lived in various regions of Canada where I studied and so forth. And so the fact that, you know, the, the Vatican and, you know, the Republic of Italy, you know, gave me the merits that they gave me is, is flattering, but it then reminds me again on how, you know, it's uh, history repeats itself. Um, your own people don't recognize you for, for the, for the great things you may have done for them, but people who are not close to you, you know, who are more independent, third party looking in can see the greatness that sometimes occurs. So for me, it's, it's, it was flattering. Um, It was always um, a a sign of pride. And that's why I wear it on all my blazers. I've always got my, my order pins there. And sometimes, you know, 
my mom likes to tease me and she says, you know, you look like one of those military guys. Like, okay, like seriously, like you always have to wear them. But it's just that little symbolic thing for me to remind me that I'm now held to a higher standard, right? Because that's what we need to understand that when you become a certain public persona or person, um, you are now held to a higher standard. You know, I always like to say I should have been born in the 50s. Those was when you were allowed to be a celebrity and do what the hell you wanted. Now, instead, when you're a celebrity, you've got restrictions on what you can do, right? Because you're held at that higher standard. So, and that's okay. I mean, I have no problem, you know, but I think, you know, it's, it's just symbolic that the son of an immigrant, you know, got sort of a, a, a recognized by, you know, by his dad's country of origin, but my own country hasn't recognized some of the philanthropy or some of the positive things that I've done. And it's just, like I said, it's just a political game. So it's okay. Well, you know, it, Matthew 13, 57, a prophet is never accepted at home. And because you could claim two homes, it is what it is. And hopefully, you know, interviews and the more that you go, because you're not old by far, you got a lot more life to live, thank God. So, you know, Canada, pay attention, because it's, you know, I would say come to America, but this, the writing is on the wall for, <laughs> for the, the, the U.S. Now, with all that you've done, have you put together a book yet of, of, you know, whether it's of your life or lessons and rules? You know, one of the things, one of the things I wanted to do, and, and I think it's always part of, of the various discussions I have when I go to universities and everything, is I wanted to write a book on the first 50 years. Right. Because I, w when the idea came up, I was 49. I was going to turn 50. And I said to myself, nothing's going to change. Everybody tells me everything's going to change when I turn 50. And I said, I don't believe it. I mean, when I was 45 and I turned 46, nothing really changed. W you know what is it's all in your mind. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I, w I was I got to be honest, I was surprised because when I turned 50, nothing changed. But a few months later, everything started changing and, and it started and I started realizing, hey, I got 25 years left technically in, in life expectancy. I got to make these 25 years count. I got to like double up the pace here. I got I to gotta be able to do in the next 25 more than I've done in the first 50. And so the idea of writing a book came up and, and basic, and the problem that I'm having is how crude of a book do I want it to be? How realistic do I want it to be? Or do I want to make it Hollywood you know, here I come, I'm buttering this thing to the max and, and, Ooh, it's so beautiful to be an entrepreneur. And it's the greatness, you know, it's like you're one of the chosen ones. If you're an entrepreneur type of thing, you know, versus should I be telling you, you know, being an entrepreneur is a uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year choice that, that you make. And, and it's not about the finish line because you never get to the finish line. It's about the journey. And, and then, you know, I like to say this often to university students. I say to them, what would you give up to be successful? And they all tell me, oh, I'm willing to work hard. And after five minutes, they, they tell me all of this. I tell them, guys, I said, what are you willing to give up? Not what are you willing to do? It's two different things here. And then they start thinking the other way. And then I make them realize that success is a pyramid. We associate it often to a pyramid, right? And as you go up this pyramid, it narrows. So there's less and less people that are as successful as you, but there's also less and less people that actually have experienced what you've experienced, which means now you have less and less people that you can share your anxieties with, your empathy with, your concerns with, and, 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 and your whole trip. And so ultimately, one of the things I tell them all the time is, if you want to be successful, prepare to be lonely prepared to realize that you will not always want to share the anxieties you live. You will not always want to share the joys you have because you may go home one day and want to share it with your wife, you know, the great day you had, but she's having a shitty day. So you don't want to, you don't want to look like you're not empathetic and vice versa. You go in another day and she's having an amazing day and you don't want to give her your anxiety. So you keep it in. And then you wake up one day and you say, but here I am top of the world, but who am I connected with? Who's my go-to person, right? And you go back to the old neighborhood and everybody says you're lucky. 
I'm lucky. If you've been there the hours that, you know, three in the morning, four in the morning that I was. And so that's the kind of book I wanted to write. Uh, the problem with writing that kind of a book is that in the middle of COVID, with, with, with all of the depressive, you know, moroseness in the air, the last thing you need is one of these realistic books to make it even more uh, 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 negative sometimes on, on what, you know, the sacrifices that one has to do to succeed. But I'll get you a book. But I'll get you a book before I turn fifty-five. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And and the scriptures say, you know, you could have one hundred and twenty years, no more. So you could possibly have sixty-eight more years left. I'm gonna, you know, put that out there. Let that prayer go up from your now, mouth, from your mouth to God's ears on that one. Okay. <laughs> hey, in Jesus Christ, and I let it be happened. It's His plan, not ours. Um, you though had said something, you know, about. When you have great news, your wife has bad news. I tell my audience, my wife is a physician from West Africa. I could have great news. She could tell me how many patients died. How do you deal with that and holding it in? Is it therapy like myself? Is it just having a group of other entrepreneurs? And like Seth Godwin talks about building your tribe. So you do have those shoulders to, you know, say hooray when you need to say hooray. I'm probably in my misfortune one of the luckiest people in the world. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. In other words, I, I'm an only child. Now, if you consider uh, an Italian immigrant family with one child, that is an oxymoron. It's like, doesn't make sense, right? I mean, I have five kids. There's a reason why I have five kids, all right? And so when you grow up alone, you're more used to being an introvert. So as much as I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert. The extrovert in me protects the introvert in me. The introvert in me is the one that's the most resilient. He's the one who's had to fight off the insecurities. He's the one that's had to talk to himself and say, hey, it's going to be okay. And he's the one who's had to look at the people around him and probably be more of a support system to them so that then, if they're all okay, and I made them be all okay, then I should be able to make myself be okay, right? So sometimes, some of the inspiration that, that keeps you being resilient is your ability to help others, right? So when I do my philanthropy, for example, when we choose to do what we do in our philanthropy, uh, you know, various uh, uh, charities we give to, Part of it is a political message telling the government you are not looking at mental health as a true condition. We are. We're willing to throw money at that and make sure that people are taken care of because of the, the impact of mental health on society. But part of it is also if I can help others and I become good at helping others, I should be able to help myself too. If I use the same inspirational work to help others, I should be able to do the same thing to me. And, and so indirectly, we feed off the people we help. But, but you, you know, you have to remember that you can't be everything to everybody. You've got to choose. And that's where the question is, what are you willing to give up? In other words, you've got to choose what you want to be. You can't be successful, an amazing businessman, entrepreneur, an amazing husband, an amazing brother, an amazing father, an amazing son, an amazing uncle. You got to fail at something. You choose what you want to fail at. And a lot of people say to me, oh, that's, that's not true. It's so negative. I don't know if it's true. What I can tell you is you look in history. You look at some of the greatest success stories of America. They have dysfunctional relationships, either with their partners or with their kids or with their families or they're isolated. Because the truth of the matter is nobody knows, right? It's, it's, like, it's like when somebody says to you, you know, I, I, I died for two minutes and I went somewhere and I came back and I can't believe what I saw. But, but nobody, nobody can vouch for you. It's the same thing here. As you're going into your entrepreneurial journey, as you're heading towards what you believe is 
the first finish line, right? And it takes you getting to about half a dozen finish lines to realize that you get zero satisfaction by getting to the finish line because you grow as you're getting there. And then when you get there, you say, but I said I needed a million bucks and I'd be fine with it. But no, now I need 10 million. Now I need 100 million. And, and all of that because you want more and more freedom, more and more liberty to do what you want. And you want to have more of a say in your community, in your surroundings. And so at the end of the day, the, you, you know, what I've come, the conclusion I've come to is, I don't, I, I've never remembered a finish line. But I have remembered a whole bunch of episodes along the way. And so that's when I started telling myself, so then really what's important is the journey. Understanding the journey, appreciating the journey, and not getting to the journey, right? So when I got my law degree, I thought it was going to be a big deal. It wasn't. It was actually a turnoff. It's like, that's it? Like, I, I don't get more than that? Like, how come I'm not feeling like, like butterflies, like the first time I ever thought I fell in love, right? And, and that's where ultimately you realize that it's the memories that count. And the memories aren't from the finish line. They're from the ups and downs. And then you also have to remember that I feel bad for the person who's never failed. Because if you've never failed, you have probably never appreciated succeeding. Because it comes to you as... You know, you take it for granted. The minute you fail, the minute you've suffered failure, when you win, it's now bittersweet. Now you like, now you say, now I understand what it is to win, right? So for all of those people out there who think, you know, oh, but, you know, life's never going to allow, you know, society's never going to allow a guy like me to, you know, become successful because they're keeping me down or whatever. Take that failure as the, the, the gasoline you need to light up the fire and, and, and make the win. And when you win, the, you know, the first time you win after you've lost for so many times, man, do you remember that day? And, and that's where ultimately, you know, we want to accomplish in life. And that's what I want to put in a book. But, you know, it's not an obvious book to write, right? Because a lot of people are going to say, well, man, why is he so negative? But, Success is about failures. And sometimes it's one success that more than annuls all of the failures you've had for the last 20 years by just one success story. Is that, and that's what's important, I think. I think we have the foundation for the book, and it's one that people would want to hear more. And whether you speak it, I have a client who spoke his book, then it was transcribed. So you got an audio book and, you know, the traditional book. And it was like, I could do this every day, Kellen. And so I think that's what you and your team, you know, just talking and putting that together, because people need to hear that. I've had, heard that from so many entrepreneurs. So many people are writing about their failures because it's not all sunshine. But you have had some successes, and we can get back to those. But I'd love to know when you're talking about, you know, your charitable work, you have the Guzzo Family Foundation. Can you talk about a community give back? that you're doing right now or that you plan on doing in the future just so people can see it's not all just designer beautiful suits with the you know the sunshine on and the medals but that you have to give back to live you cannot be successful and not give back you can't hoard it all like Scrooge McDuck you know so can you talk more about your community give back so look I give you an example when we started giving to hospitals most people you know, give to hospitals and basically what they're looking for is the pavilion name, you know, and they want to, you know, put, put on the map, their family name and the success story and whatever. We had to choose who we wanted to give to. And we said, you know what? I'd like to give to the imaging department of hospitals. And everybody thought it's a little strange. Like it's almost like one of those awkward departments that everybody uses, but nobody really cares for. And I said to them, I says, you know, it's a political message by giving to the imaging department. Because a lot of people don't realize that the imaging department is the funnel that actually controls the amount of surgeries you'll have. Because if you don't have the results from the imaging, I don't know what treatment to give you. So if I only have one imaging machine and I stall the imaging results or I delay 
your repeated testing on the imaging to see what we, how your, for example, cancer would progress, I'm just delaying your treatment. So what I did is when I gave the money, the first time we gave money for an imaging machine, we actually insisted that the old imaging machine be kept operational. And therefore, what happens is twice the amount of results were issued. And then I get a call from the government saying to me, hey, buddy, what are you doing? You're screwing up my budget. And this is well, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, now you've got twice as many results. I've got to have twice as many surgeries. It's screwing up our budget. And I said, yeah, I know. But in the meantime, you're letting people suffer. And so money's, you know, the, the mental health impact of being told you have something, but we can't do anything about it. We're going to wait six months to see how it progresses. What do you mean we're going to wait six months for how it progresses? Get this thing out of me, right? I mean, I don't want this thing to grow. Get it out of me. And so it's important to help your community be mentally sane and physically healthy and to give back to humanity, I think it's, it's, it's our way of validating some of the sacrifices we've made. It's our way of sometimes validating some of the gray area behavior we've had. But ultimately, it's the intention. And the intention is to give back to the community that's given to us, right? During COVID, you've heard a lot of people say, remember that restaurant? that gave 500 bucks to your kids' uh, peewee league uh, hockey or, or soccer or football, they're going to need you now. So instead of ordering, you know, or, or, you know, instead of going somewhere else on vacation and spending the money somewhere else, why don't you spend it locally with your restaurants, with your businesses that helped you when they could? They're going to need your help now. And I think it's very important to realize that I have nothing against international business, but I don't know if it's a smart idea that 80% of everything that's produced in the world is produced in three countries and, and everybody else is just a bunch of engineers and financial uh, advisors. Maybe we should bring back production to North America. Maybe vaccines should not be all produced in one foreign country, but they should be produced locally so that there's a minimum of security that we get, right? I mean... And it's okay to think everybody should be making lots of money. You know, a minimum wage should be through the roof. But you have to remember that when minimum wage is through the roof, everything else costs through the roof. And therefore, it's a spinning effect. And it's a catch-22. So ultimately, giving back is good for the soul, good for the mind. And it's actually, you know, a political message that you're giving politicians on how you as a successful business person would do things slightly differently. In, to, in today's climate, I wanna make something very clear though, because when they hear you say that, somebody, I can already hear them, you know, they may be all the way in, who knows, Istanbul, and say, well, easy to say for a guy who's on TV making a lot of money, he doesn't even know what minimum wage is, but this is a man who has grown up in the movie business, uh, in the movie theater business, started as a, you know, like an usher or worked your way up actually from an usher. So you know what hard work is. Your dad just didn't give you, here, have it. And, you know, you run it and start telling all these people what to do. You, he had to work his way up. So you have to keep that in mind. For those of you, who I know, because as soon as you talk about success, there's that person in handful. Oh, no, it's easy for you to say that, um, it, you know. And so I want to make that very clear. Now, you have movies and you also have movie products. You have said that to other journalists that, you know, uh, companies blow up sometimes when America buys into them. You have some popcorn that we need to buy into because we're the fattest people on earth. So what are the plans to get your popcorn on this side of the border? We're actually working with a New York distributor and we're working with a uh, uh, Florida-based distributor to get the popcorn into the U.S. I know that the Mr. Sunshine Popcorn will be on the uh, People's Choice Award Awards in January. And so we're, we're doing our best to get it down there. Um, and it is, you know, it is one of those uh, spinoffs from my core business, which is the movie business. Uh, but it's also a fun part of the business. Uh, it's something that I, you know, I love doing. I love coming up with the various 
Uh, you know, for example, we have a French toast uh, flavored popcorn. And, we, and, and even the way we do it is slightly different. I'll send you some. You, you'll understand how we get to the various flavors uh, that we come up to. We don't try and create a powder that tastes that taste. We actually mix various popcorns together to come up with the flavor that we're looking for. Wow. I can't wait. In, in Florida, my Florida neighbors, we're, we're here. We'll be the first ones to get it. So, you know, and enjoy it. Um, so I love to hear that. I, let the people know where they can, you know, follow you, connect. The links will be in the description, people. But I want them to kind of see everything you have and then kind of wait and bug you for that book that, you know, we'll be waiting on. So, yeah, let them know. Yeah. So you can go on. I look, so I'm on Instagram under the Lord Guzzo. Uh, tag. I'm on uh, Twitter under Guzzo Vincenzo, and I'm on Facebook under Vince Guzzo. So you can find me on those. I I'm also on LinkedIn, by the way, so you can reach out to me there as well. And when I can at, at night, I, I like to, you know, DM people back. And as long as everybody stays courteous, I'm all in for answering back people on uh, on uh, on social media. Well, you guys have gotten the game. You got some homework. Hopefully, we may be able to get him in a stylish um, cowboy hat. So, Tim McGraw has my next 30 years. You put out my next 68 years, and boom. Audience. I have a, get, you know, I have a cowboy hat from Calgary. When I went to the University of Calgary, they gave me my white, white Stetton. It's, it's amazing. It actually looks good on me. I was surprised I look so good in a cowboy hat, and it actually adds a few inches. Makes me taller. So I'm going to bug him off air, you guys, about, you know, what's up with the album. If um, what's Joe's name from my master chef, he's also a musician. I forgot Joe. He's an Italian guy, too. And he does music. If he can do it, we all can do it, live our life. And we go from there. You guys, if you do nothing else, make sure you share this game. It will change somebody's life. Hi, guys. I'm Kai Gabiam from the Diaspora Channel, a lover of Africa. If you love Africa as well, and you would love to visit one day or to relocate to Africa, there is a course out there for you. And this course is my first trip to Africa, a course well put together by a seasoned traveler, Kellen Cash. Coleman. This course is designed to prepare you to travel better, which will save you both time and money. And the great news is this course costs only $20, guys. It can't get any better. Go right now and enroll to this course at www.diversifygame.com. Don't miss out. Game over.